The End of Utopia by Russell Jacoby Chapter 4 Intellectuals From Utopia to Myopia Who are intellectuals? If they are defined simply as the educated intellectuals have existed for millennia as priests, scribes, and clerks, and they will continue as teachers, specialists, and technicians. Here are the instruments needed by clerks, stated a 13th century Parisian observer. Books, a desk, an evening lamp with tallow and candle holder, a lantern and an inkwell with ink, a pen, a lead pencil and ruler for ruling lines, a table and a ferrule, a chair, a blackboard, a pumice stone, along with an erasing knife and chalk. The historian Jacques Le Goff cited this description in his study, Intellectuals in the Middle Ages. According to Le Goff, intellectuals emerged with the 12th century towns. The expansive definition may mislead, however. The issue may be less how long scholars and clerks have existed than when they coalesced as a group and gained self-awareness and a name. This is a relatively new development. In a study of intellectuals in antiqu antiquity, Paul Zanker, a professor of classical archaeology, admits they did not exist as a recognized entity. Neither the Greeks nor the Romans recognized intellectuals as a defined group within society. The term and reality emerged much more recently, in the latter 19th century in Europe and Russia. In both countries, Intellectuals took shape as dissenters and revolutionaries. The Russian experience is instructive since it contributed not only a word, the, the intelligentsia, but dense and illuminating discussions. As critics, novelists, and revolutionaries, the intelligentsia played a key role throughout the 19th and early 20th centuries. One sliver of this history might be helpful. In the wake of the revolution of 1905, a collection of essays by and on the intelligentsia titled Landmarks achieved great success. In the words of its editor, it sought to tell the Russian intelligentsia the bitter truth about itself. Its contributors grappled with the meaning and role of the intelligentsia. Peter Struve, the liberal or legal Marxist, noted that the term had various usages but stated he had no intention of conflating the intelligentsia and the educated class. If this were done, the intelligentsia has existed in Russia for a long time and represented nothing remarkable. Rather, for Struve, the Russian intelligentsia distinguished itself by its ideological and political force and its alienation from and hostility towards the state, as well as its, as its irreligiosity. These, char these characteristics surfaced in the intelligentsia's attraction to anarchism and socialism. If this was a simplification in both Russia and France, where the term intellectuals emerged during the Dreyfus Affair, intellectuals did appear as critics of state and society, often as socialists and Marxists. The story, the story of the emergence of intellectuals during the Dreyfus Affair has often been told. It gave rise to the locus classicus of intellectuals, Emile Zola's open letter, Jacques, which appealed to truth and justice and closed with a string of accusations against the state and its agents. I accuse General Merce Mercier, I accuse the three handwriting experts, I accuse the offices of war, I accuse the first court martial. I have but one desire, seeing the light in the name of humanity that has so suffered and that has a right to happiness. Eric Cam, a historian of the affair, summarized, The affair thus witnessed the birth of the modern idea of the intellectual committed as a member of a group, made up of writers, artists, and those living by their intellect. The committed intellectual is placed outside the power structures of his society and he gives his opinion in the name of high ethical or intellectual principles without regard to official truths. The left inherited this notion of the intellectual. 
In principle, it sympathized with and supported intellectuals, independent dissenters, appealing to universal categories. Yet history has not been kind to this model. In the course of the 20th century, intellectuals have migrated into institutions to become specialists and professors. At the same time, they have turned suspicious of universal categories as unscientific or oppressive. Bernard Henry Levi, one or Levy, wondered if the following would appear in the French dictionaries of the future. Intellectual, masculine noun, social and cultural category emerged at Paris during the Dreyfus Affair, died at Paris at the end of the 20th century. The fate of a utopian vision is bound up with the fate of intellectuals. For if utopia ever found a home, it was among the independent thinkers and coffeehouse patrons. To the degree these no longer exist, the utopian vision flags. To be sure, this is a subject thick with myth and questions. Did intellectuals really ever gather in coffee houses? Did these environs stamp their thought and writing? Is there an affinity between utopia and independent intellectuals? And if intellectuals decamped from old haunts to seminars and conference rooms, what were the gains as well as the losses? One aspect of the shift may illuminate the eclipse of utopianism among intellectuals. Language and thought register the specific conditions of their gestation. No one completely transcends history to subsist in the 18th century as an independent writer, hatching projects, affects prose and thought one way. To function in the 20th century as a professor, preparing college lectures and conference papers affects them in another. In his book on Samuel Johnson and the life of writing, Paul Fuso reflects on the numerous genres that the 18th century critic mastered, including a dictionary, tragedies, essays, travel, books, poetry, and sermons. To follow Johnson's lead today, believes Fussell, and begin a literary career with a narrative poem or travel book would be to begin, would be to begin no literary career at all. The fact is that no matter what one's ambitions of freedom, one writes essentially what other people are writing. Fussell may be right, but not only conformity to fashion or expectation limits genres. Institutions, the market, forms of leisure, and the conditions of work also determine the possibilities. These nourish the limpid essay or opaque book. The timber of prose alters from the essays of Joseph Addison in the 18th century to the monographs of professors in the 20th. The former partake of the openness and informality of the coffee house, the latter of the hierarchy and structure of the university. It was said of Socrates, wrote Addison in the aim of the spectator, that he brought philosophy down from heaven to inhabit among men. And I shall be ambitious to have said it, to have it said of me, that I have brought philosophy out of closets and libraries, schools and colleges, to dwell in clubs and assemblies, at tea tables and in coffee houses. Today, not only the ambition, but the, but the cadence of language and perhaps the texture of thought has changed. Current academic writing often claims an unprecedented boldness and modernity, but usually betrays deference and insularity, tangled webs of acknowledgements and cliches. Addison and Steele are dead runs the apt title of a recent criticism of English department jargon and professionalism. Neither Addison nor Johnson were utopians, nor can it be maintained that lucidity and utopia are linked, at least directly. For instance, the writings of Charles Fourier, the dazzling and almost unhinged utopian, often baffle readers. Yet many of his passages soar, and an unmatched vision of emancipation animates his work. Utopian thinking may require conceptual and perhaps real space, which Fourier, the permanent and perpetual outsider, had in abundance. From his beginnings as an isolated and unrecognized provincial autodidact to his last years as one of the otter habitués of the cafés, and reading rooms of the Palais Royal, writes Fourier's biographer, he was at pains to separate himself from the ruling ideas and the ruling thinkers. 
Without intellectuals or with recast intellectuals, utopia may fade away. Utopia here refers not only to a vision of a future society, but a vision pure and simple, an ability perhaps, or an ability, perhaps willingness, to use expansive concepts to see reality and its possibilities. Mental breathing space might be necessary to sustain these sight lines. As bureaucracies absorb intellectual life, the lines break up into fields and departments. The vision and writing of intellectuals contract. Thinking and prose turn cramped and con contorted. Intellectuals contract. Thinking, oh sorry, <laughs> intellectuals retreat in the name of progress to narrower, narrower turfs and smaller concepts. They disdain lucidity itself, akin of light and the enlightenment. Two books published in the late 1920s, Julian Benda's The Betrayal of the Intellectuals and Karl Mannheim's Ideology and Utopia, connote a shift in the commitments of intellectuals. Benda's, appeal, Benda's appealed to an intellectual model in Eclipse, Mannheim's to one in Ascendancy. Benda, who had intervened in the Dreyfus Affair, called for intellectuals to remain loyal to universal ideas of truth and justice, which he saw almost as a spiritual mission. He charged betrayal when intellectuals rallied, rallied it to a specific nation, class, or race. These intellectuals have set out to exalt the will of men to feel conscious of themselves as distinct from others, and to proclaim as contemptible every tendency to establish oneself in a universal. Benda feared a future in which intellectuals, manipulating political passions, would cause the organized slaughter of nations or classes. Benda's prescient betrayal, which evoked the philo philosophes of the Enlightenment, might be seen as summarizing a tradition that was ending. He did not quote Voltaire, but might have. Men of letters, wrote Voltaire, are isolated writers who have neither argued Ar arguified on the benches of the universities, nor said things by halves in the, in the academies, and these have nearly all been persecuted. He added that if you write odes to the march, or to the monarch, <laughs> to the march, to the monarch, you will, you will be well received, enlightened men, and you will be crushed. Or Benda could have cited the great utopian Condorcet, who lauded the class of men who devoted themselves to the tracking down of prejudices in the hiding places where the priests, the schools, the governments, and all long-established institutions had gathered and protected them. These men took as their battle cry, reason, tolerance, humanity. If Benda's book registered the passing of an, inte an intellectual type, Mannheim's heralded the new species, the professional beyond ideologies and utopias. Mannheim not only captured the transformation to the post-utopian intellectual in his writings, his own life expressed the shifts which he both celebrated and bemoaned. He belonged to a generation of Hungarian philosophers, poets, and Marxists, like George Lucas and Arnold Hauser, who gathered in Budapest at the end of World War I, searching for a new culture to heal the ills of society. The heady days when empires dissolved and revolutions surged did not last. Twice a refugee from Hungary and Germany, Mannheim ended his career as a professor of education at the University of London, advocating democratic planning. Ideology and utopia justified a skepticism about utopia that has since become common coin. Mannheim argued for a scientific approach to ideology and politics in which all knowledge was per partisan and particular none with a superior purchase on truth. Marxists had confined ideology to the ideas they opposed, assuming their own ideas were true. Mannheim, ex Mannheim exempted no ideas from the label of ideology. Intellectuals were no longer charged with ferreting our truth and untruth. Rather, they became professional doubters, equally distant from ideology and utopia. In the end, they mistrusted reason and truth. The notion that the left forthrightly supported intellectuals distorts the historical reality. 
It often saw them as elitists and manipulators and utopians. Anarchists from Bakunin in the 19th century to Chomsky in the 20th century have suspected that intellectuals lacked the discipline, selflessness, and humility essential for a serious politics. Intellectuals were power-hungry elitists. Marxists hardly differed. They saw intellectuals as shirkers, if not bourgeois sympathizers. At the turn of the century, a Polish-Russian anarchist, Jan Mikhachtsky, believed he had discovered the cause of recent political defeats. Intellectuals to whom workers look for leadership, form a class, and seek power for themselves. Mikhachtsky developed what might be called a Marxist critique of Marxism. In the name of Marxism, intellectuals pursued their own economic interests. They were less revolutionary leaders than self-interested office seekers. In a 1902 May Day appeal, Mikhachtsky called upon workers to abandon to abandon the intelligentsia who used the labor movement to gain cushy jobs in the state. For an obscure radical whose writings have hardly been translated out of Russian and mainly published in Switzerland, Mikhachtsky's idea of intellectuals forming their own class enjoyed amazing success, popping up across the decades. For many anarchists and dissident leftists, Mikhachtsky's argument explains what happened to the Russian Revolution intellectuals hijacked it. Critics of Stalinism from Leon Trotsky to the Yugoslavian dissident Milovan de Gilles echoed Mikhachsky, arguing that intellectuals constituted a new group of bureaucrats that had captured the state and cast aside the working class. In its more extreme formulation, for instance, as developed by an American follower, Max Nomad, Mikhachsky illuminates what happens to all revolutionary projects. Intellectuals manipulate them for their own ends. Nomad, a marginal figure in New York leftist circles, realized that his argument may be grist to the mill of reactionaries who take pleasure in disparaging the eggheads. He protested that a reviewer called one of his previous books a javelin hurled at the intellectuals. Nomad insisted that he sided with the rebels and dispossessed, But as with many anarchists, his deep suspicion of intellectuals led him into a cul-de-sac, damning his readers and audience as power-hungry and unreliable. His Skeptics, Political Dictionary and Handbook for the Disenchanted, defined an intellectual as the descendant of the medicine man, priest or magician, who has submitted or substituted science and literature for the hocus-pocus of his sires. The intellectual is either a satisfied partner of power or dreams of his own enthronement in the seats of power as office holder or manager. The acute suspicion of intellectuals remains alive and well in contemporaries like Noam Chomsky, whose political past partakes of the world of Mikhachsky and Nomad, the anarchist left. Chomsky disparages Marxist parties as just groups of intellectuals. The MIT linguist observes that for quite understandable reasons, an antagonism divides intellectuals and and anarchists. Anarchism offers no position of privilege or power to the intelligentsia. In fact, it undermines that position. Chomsky's most famous essays, such as The Responsibility of Intellectuals and Objectivity and Liberal Scholarship, chart the betrayal of intellectuals. American Power and the New Mandarins, the title of the volume that included these essays, put it concisely. The New Mandarins are intellectuals, mainly professors, who serve American power. For Chomsky, intellectuals will inevitably adopt an elitist position seeking to manage and control society. Come here. A palpable disdain for intellectuals infuses his writings. He refers to intellectuals' mindless incantation of state propaganda or to their debased norms of educated discourse. He writes that intellectuals are typically the most profoundly indoctrinated and, in a deep sense, the most ignorant group. Marxists were rarely more hospitable than the anarchists. They also mistrusted intellectuals as bourgeois sympathizers and elitists, 
who lacked true grit and commitment. In a typical statement, August Bebel, one of the 19th century leaders of the German Social Democrats, advised his party to take a careful look at every party comrade. But in the case of an academic or an intellectual, don't just look once, but twice or three times. In his informative book on intellectuals, subtitled History of an Insult, Ditz Bering, a professor of German philology, collects epithets Marxists have used for intellectuals, waverers, opportunists, individualists, vacillators, sellouts, and bourgeois lackeys. Many intellectuals recall the suspicion they provoked within leftist parties. Christopher Isherwood reported on his interview by a German communist functionary in Berlin in 1931. You have interest for our movement? His eyes measured me for the first time. No, he was not impressed. Equally, he did not condemn. A young bourgeois intellectual, he thought, enthusiastic within certain limits, educated within certain limits. Of some small use, I felt myself blushing deeply. Richard Wright recounted his experience with the Communist Party in Chicago that took place a few years later. I was shocked to hear that I, who had been only to grammar school, had been classified as an intellectual. What was an intellectual? It connoted unreliability. Sometime later, a comrade hinted he should leave the party. Intellectuals don't fit well in the party, right? He said solemnly. We've kept records of the trouble we've had with intellectuals in the past. It's estimated that only 13% of them remain in the party. He added ominously, the Soviet Union has had to shoot a lot of intellectuals. Or hang them. Milan Kundera's novel, The Book of Laughter and Forgetting, set decades later in Soviet Czechoslovakia, opens with a historical event, the hanging of leading Czech communists, communists, period. Kundera's main character finds himself accused by an old girlfriend of making love like an intellectual. In the political jargon of the day, intellectual was an expletive. It designated a person who failed to understand life and was cut off from the people. All communists hanged at the time by other communists had that curse bestowed upon them. Unlike people with their feet firmly planted on the ground, they supposedly floated in air. In a sense, then, it was only fair they have the ground pulled out from under them once and for all and be left there hanging slightly above it. Even Antonio Gramsci, whom Marxists idolize partly because he was one of the few who wrote sympathetically about intellectuals and partly because he died in one of Mussolini's jails, does not fundamentally differ from other Marxists. He hoped to sub to supplant traditional intellectuals of the church and academy with a new type of organic intellectuals who were rooted in the proletariat. And like many Marxists, he viewed industrial labor as the basis for a new type of intellectual. In the modern world, technical education closely bound to industrial labor must form the basis of the new type of intellectual. This new type will not be defined by eloquence, but by active participation in practical life as constructor, organizer, permanent persuader. Moreover, for Gramsci, the subordination of intellectuals to the revolutionary party and working class remained primary. The most interesting question is, what is the character of the political party in relation to the problem of intellectuals? His answer ran, the political party is precisely the mechanism responsible for welding together the organic intellectuals. The party carries out this function in strict dependence on its basic function. As the historian John Patrick Diggins observes, however one defines intellectuals, mandarins, scribes, clerks, Gramsci's prescriptions tend to reduce them to instruments of organization and persuasion. Grams Gramsci exhorted intellectuals to merge with the masses. Of course, the left extent of course, the left extends beyond the anarchists and Marxists. No single formula can express its relationship to intellectuals. Again, Mannheim might be seen as a typical figure. He viewed himself as defending independent intellectuals. As a refugee, he felt rootless and homeless. We want to find home, a world, he wrote, because we feel that we have no place in this world. 
Mannheim tried to convert this instability into a virtue. He rejected the standard leftist view that labeled intellectuals as bourgeois, nor did he believe they could be considered working class. Rather, intellectuals are situated between classes. They are relatively unattached or free-floating. Hitherto, the negative side of the unattachedness of the intellectuals, Mannheim wrote, has been emphasized, meaning their instability and lack of resolution. Intellectuals have sought to escape this precariousness by attaching themselves to a class or a party. But for this Jewish-Hungarian refugee, independence was a virtue, not a liability. It might allow intellectuals to glimpse a total perspective, perhaps to play the part of watchmen in what otherwise would be a pitch-black night. Mannheim's defense of independent intellectuals earned him the ire of both left and right. Virtually nowhere, concludes one study of Mannheim, did he find support. To communists, Mannheim's ideas on the relatively unattached intellectuals constituted crude bourgeois apologetics, a pretense that intellectuals did not represent the ruling, exploiting class. To socialists, Mannheim did not understand that the intelligentsia will escape its homelessness once it cooperates with a socialist organization. To conservatives, Mannheim's ideas expressed a variant of European nihilism, a state of mind already well described by Nietzsche, of uprooted modern intellectual strata. The political hostility has declined, and Mannheim has become a well-known and well-cited reference. But few have followed his analysis of intellectuals as unattached and between classes. Why? The reason may be less the political implications than the sociological realities. Since Mannheim, the structural shifts that affect intellectuals have become so obvious that few can deny them. If Mannheim's analysis of the free-floating intellectuals seemed questionable in the late 1920s, 80 years later it is outright impossible. Today, intellectuals are increasingly attached, affiliated, or institutionalized. Mannheim can be seen as the last theorist of the independent intellectuals, not the first. After Mannheim, the older vision of intellectuals as independent and rootless makes way for a view of intellectuals as dependent and connected. Conservatives were hardly more receptive to intellectuals than those on the left, to be sure, the history of intellectuals and conservatism is briefer than that of intellectuals and the left. Fewer intellectuals identify themselves with conservatism, a fact registered in the contemporary scholarship. Hundreds, probably thousands of books have been written about leftist, Marxist, feminist, or socialist intellectuals, but only a handful of books have appeared on conservative intellectuals. Conservative intellectuals cherish religion or tradition or the, or the state as creations rooted in something deeper than reason. At a certain point, they remove the insignia of the intellectual, reason, to wear the colors of church or state or nation, or they risk undermining their own loyalties. From William F. Buckley to Michael Novak, it is not surprising that Catholic intellectuals have led the conservative movement in America. To these thinkers, secular intellectuals appear as dangerous and rootless souls, individuals with no commitments. Consequently, apart from a love of books or learning, conservative intellectuals often nurture an anti-intellectualism. They charge that intellectuals subvert culture and society. Paul Johnson exemplifies the species. He is a historian, a journalist of great reach, and a conservative intellectual. He also has written a book on intellectuals, simply called Intellectuals, that must be judged a rant. It catalogues unpaid bills, unhappy companions, and misconduct that constituted the lives of intellectuals from Rousseau to Jean-Paul Sartre. Ibsen might have presented himself as a radical and progressive, but did you know and do you care that he was actually very cantankerous, hated long banquets, especially when seated next to elderly suffragettes, was afraid of dogs and heights, had an illegitimate child, and was anxious about money. For Johnson, the personal disorder of the lives of intellectuals bellies their ideas and writings. On this basis, he rates intellectuals somewhat below any chance gathering of people. Part of his conclusion reads, 
a dozen people picked at random on the street are at least as likely to offer sensible views on moral and political matters as a cross-section of the intelligentsia. But it would go further. One of the principal lessons of our tragic century is beware intellectuals. Not merely should they be kept well away from the levers of power, they should also be objects of particular suspicion. Although hardly supported by the left and right, the classic portrayal of isolated intellectuals upholding universal ideas has inspired countless souls over the centuries and continues to evoke a response. Today, the picture looks faded, however. The universal standards are increasingly challenged as the tool of an imperialist West, and the imperatives of professionalization redefine intellectual concerns. To be sure, many intellectuals see themselves in the classic pose as beleaguered outsiders, challenging an oppressive state or church. In some parts of the world, this self-image reflects the reality. In contemporary Algeria, to be an intellectual is to court assassination. Yet in North America and Western Europe, the situation is very different. Intellectuals are neither endangered nor dangerous. Only a few conservatives continue to rail against intellectuals as subversive. In the main, intellectuals seem hardly revolutionary or marginal. The image of the ridiculous and inept intellectual or the absent-minded professor, kindred to that of the isolated and useless writer, has also disappeared from popular mythology. Sorry, mythology. Why? Probably because it lacks veracity or resonance. Satire needs to be, or satire needs to pluck a chord of reality. Intellectuals today are depicted less as bumbling outsiders than smooth insiders. When intellectuals are caricatured, as in the novels of David Lodge, they are presented as operators and hustlers. The New York Times Magazine regularly features pieces on high-flying professors, their wardrobes, salaries, and successes, a genre of journalism almost inconceivable 75 years ago. The most intellectuals do not receive big salaries, or that most intellectuals do not receive big salaries, and fat appointments is not the issue. Over the last 50 years, a decisive shift in the place of intellectuals has occurred. Richard Ofstadter's 1963 Anti-Intellectualism in American Life, his worried survey of intellectuals, can now be seen as a book of the 1950s. The decisive defeat of Stevenson by Eisenhower in two presidential elections and the longer shadow of McCarthyism prompted his study. Sensing a deep American anti-intellectualism, Hofstadter displayed several exhibits as evidence. He quoted a magazine description of an egghead as a person of spurious intellectual pretensions, often a professor, a doctrinaire supporter of middle European socialism, a self-conscious prig. Hofstadter joined other commentators such as David Reisman and Nathan Glazer, who fretted who fretted that America in general and with and McCarthyism in particular, exuded a poisonous anti-intellectualism. Even as he wrote the book, Hofstadter realized something had changed, however. In 1956, Time ran a cover story announcing a new spirit traversed the nation. America now embraced in intellectuals. What does it mean to be an intellectual in the U.S.? asked Time. Is he really in such an unhappy plight the ridiculed double dome, the egghead, the wild eyed, absent minded man who is made to feel an alien in his own country. According to Time, Jacques Barzin, the Columbia University professor and writer, represented a new species, a growing host of men of ideas who not only have the respect of the nation, but who return the compliment. <coughs> The shock of a Soviet satellite in 1957 and the onset of Kennedy's presidency in 1961 redoubled the respect. By the early 1960s, intellectuals were welcomed, sometimes honored in the highest reaches of government. The title of David Halberstam's book 
on the Kennedy's years, the best and the brightest, refers partly to the intellectual cream that followed toward Washington, or that flowed toward Washington. A new breed of thinkers, doers, half of academe, half of the nation's think tanks, headed to the capital. People like McGeorge Bundy, who was educated at Groton and Yale and had taught at Harvard. The value of knowledge, training, and education rose dramatically. Intellectuals have come to enjoy more acceptance and, in some ways, a more satisfactory position, stated Hofstadter in his conclusion. Most intellectuals embrace the change, but some affect disaffection, claiming a marginality they do not have. To put this sharply, once intellectuals were outsiders who wanted to be insiders. Now they are insiders who pretend to be outsiders, a claim that can be sustained only by turning marginality into a pose. This is not the whole story, but maybe half of it. The other half is the admission, even celebration of their new insider status as career professionals. These are two responses to the same process. Both signify the eclipse of an older reality, which to be sure was always partly mythic of the independent intellectual. The scholarly literature both reflects and analyzes these transformations. In recent decades, to crudely generalize, studies regularly appear analyzing intellectuals as a professional group with professional interests. For instance, a new book on intellectuals concludes that they have moved from the margins of society towards a more central position. The terrain of intellectuals has become more and more institutionalized, professionalized, and commercialized. An editor of a book on intellectuals states, Everyone seems to agree that intellectuals today are bound up in institutional circumstances as never before. Society now requires, concludes another study, the mass production of academically trained professionals. A sign of this change is Pierre Bourdieu's Homo Academicus, which from its title to its content illustrates how the study of intellectuals and academics has itself become a scientific field or subfield. The place, role, and impact of intellectuals can be graphed and dissected. Bourdieu turns the tables on the academic intellectual, trapping the supreme class classifié in the net of scientific classifications. Among the tools he uses to snare his prey are death notices and home addresses. From these, he calculates the clout of intellectuals or what he calls their cultural capital. Obituaries and professional journals, he writes, are first-rate documents for revealing group values the last judgment made by the group on one of its deceased members. Was the late and lamented professor called original, erudite, or merely diligent? The book bristles with scientific graphs with captions like the space of the arts and social science faculties, analysis of correspondences, plane of the first and second axes of inertia, individuals. Classification two, classificatory machine number two, from academic classification to social classification and the morphological transformations of the faculties. His book suggests that willy-nilly intellectuals have become institutionalized. They constitute a sufficiently coherent object that can be studied by scientifically minded sociologists. The subject of the study intellectuals has become an object. Benda wanted independent intellectuals to defend universal values. Little could be less likely or fashionable. Today, intellectuals put a question mark after or, after or quotations around any reference to universal values, signifying their doubts. Oppositional intellectuals prize the specific and local. They prefer words like difference that address what is unique, not what is general. They distrust Meta narratives of freedom and equality, Zola's appeal to humanity and its rights and its right to happiness belongs to a discarded past. As Jean Francois Lyotard, Lyotard puts it, traditional intellectuals appeal to a universal subject. 
Today, however, intellectuals can no longer intervene in public affairs in the name of the universal. The only possibilities are local and defensive. The species of the universal intellectuals is becoming rare or indeed extinct, states Mohammed Sabur, a sociologist. The universal or prophetic intellectual on the model of Sartre, writes Jeremy Jennings, a political theorist, has all but disappeared. The cliché that left and right converge seems accurate. All parties share an aversion to utopian thought and universal concepts, although each is driven by a different logic. One school of conservatism always challenged the abstractions engendered by the Enlightenment and the French Revolution, the talk of rights and equality, and put in its place loyalty to specific traditions and practices. <clears throat> More recently, leftist intellectuals have come to the same position. They tout what is distinct and unique and decree metaphysics, theories that pass beyond the immediate discourse or circumstances. Both right and left revive dubious notions of localism and nativism. Although the new institutional realities of intellectual life must be recognized, they need not be applauded. Not lamentation, but an appreciation of the losses as well as the gains is necessary. Yet for many observers, the transformation of intellectuals into professionals ratifies the notion of progress. Of course, the observers are also those being observed. They not only register the change, they like what they see themselves. For Bruce Robbins, a Rutgers University English professor, the old style, less morally credible independent intellectuals have been supplanted by professionals with greater legitimacy. In past imperfect French intellectuals, 1944 to 1956, Tony Jutt gives an upbeat report on the decline of French independent intellectuals like Jean-Paul Sartre. For Jutt, a New York University history professor, Sartre and company suffered from serious failings that can partly be explained by the fact they existed outside institutionalized restraints. He celebrates their decline and replacement by professors who are much more responsible and careful thinkers. <laughs> awesome. Unlike the preceding generation, the professors are experts writing in specialized journals for specialized audiences, not in newspapers for average citizens. This encourages a degree of modesty and care, deriving from the typical professorial sense it is one's colleagues rather than the world whom one has to convince. This marks a distinct change from earlier decades when the writings of Malraux, Camus, Sartre, Meunier, and their peers, often half-informed, frequently lazy and ignorant, provoked no such rebukes. In the civil society of today's intellectual community, the market operates with reasonable efficiency. Left to their own devices, intellectuals are thus better placed to retain their local influence if they can point to the imprimatur of quality that comes with institutional attachment and disciplinary conventions. The correspondence between the decline of the great public intellectuals and the resurrection of the professors is thus no mere coincidence. This dude's just really far up his own ass. This analysis has the virtue of forthrightness. It celebrates professionalization, the market, disciplinary conventions, and institutional attachments as improving the quality of intellectual life, which Jutt believes used to be rotten and corrupt. What is striking is not just the buoyancy of the analysis. Intellectual life is getting better and better, but how much this position is shared with different twists across the political spect spectrum. Feminists, post-structuralists, deconstructionists, post-colonialists, and others cheer the demise of the old intellectuals and rise of the new professionals. Like Jutt, Jonathan Culler, a Cornell University English professor, offers a happy tale of professionalization. He protests the crisis narratives that blame professionalization and, uh, and academization. He stoutly maintains we must assert the value not just of specialization, but of professionalization also, explaining how professionalization makes thought possible. 
Kohler turns misty-eyed when he writes about the virtues of specialization. It gives rise to serious works of criticism or scholarship, not to be confused with newspaper articles, works of popularization, or especially commentary. It leads to judicious and democratic judgments by peers. I think we know for sure that's not true, but okie doke. While reducing capriciousness and favoritism in important decisions, <laughs> this progress in professionalism shifts power from the vertical hierarchy of the institution that employs a critic to a horizontal system of evaluation. Again, not true. Michael Walzer, the left-leaning political theorist, joins in with a paean to professionalization and, if not conformity, social success and adjustment. He finds that critics in the modern period generally flourish as insiders. Sartre edited the most influential journal in post-war France. Foucault held a chair in the esteemed Collège de France. To consider these people unrecognized outsiders is implausible, writes Walzer. Critics today are not peculiarly hostile to the societies in which they live. They are not peculiarly alienated from these societies. They write what Walzer calls mainstream criticism. This pleases Walzer. The mainstream is better. He upends the conventional picture of the intellectual as an alienated outsider. Marginality is not a condition that makes for disinterest, dispassion, open-mindedness, or objectivity. Rather, disconnected criticism tends toward manipulation, what Walter politely calls unattractive politics. Walter, a lifetime member of a research society, the Institute for Advanced Studies, which gathers for weekly lunches in Princeton, offers a better alternative model for the intellectual. Someone who is member of a learned institute or club, the local judge, the connected critic, who earns his authority or fails to do so by arguing with his fellows. As if there could be some doubt, Walzer notes, this critic is one of us. And like one of us, the critic is no enemy of society. He or she wants the major economic and political enterprises to go well. Further to the left, New York University professor Andrew Ross agrees. In No Respect, Intellectuals and Popular Culture, he writes that today it is clear that the mantle of opposition no longer rests upon the shoulders of an autonomous avant-garde. Neither the elite metropolitan intellectuals nor the romantic neo-bohemians. Rather, it relies on technical or specific intellectuals and on professional humanists who exert a specialist influence in areas of contestation within the academy. In heralding the achievements of this new specialism, Ross believes he bucks a reactionary consensus of left and right, each unswervingly loyal to their respective narratives of decline. What reactionary consensus? Ross swims with the current. Yet the old image of intellectuals as marginalized dissenters who attack injustice does not simply vanish. Many of those who enthusiastically bury this image turn about and coolly announce that they themselves are marginalized intellectuals. Virtually a straight line can be drawn from Voltaire to Edward Said, whose recent representations of the intellectual advances an idea of the intellectual as a vulnerable critic on the outside. The intellectual, he writes, is someone whose place it is publicly to raise embarrassing questions, to confront orthodoxy and dogma, to be someone who cannot easily be co-opted by governments or corporations. The intellectual, he states, always has a choice, either to side with the weaker, the less well-represented, the forgotten or ignored, or to side with the more powerful. And there is something fundamentally unsettling about intellectuals who have neither offices to protect nor territory to consolidate and guard. Self-irony is therefore more frequent than pomposity, directness, more than hemming and hawing. But there is no dodging the inescapable reality that such representations by intellectuals will neither make them friends in high places nor win them official honors. It is a lonely condition. This is an engaging portrait, but what relationship does it bear to reality? No honors, no hemming and hawing, no offices or territory to defend. 
Lonely existence where? Maybe in Egypt or Albania, but hardly in the United States or France. Can we say that Derrida or Said or Henry Louis Gates Jr. Had, uh, lead unrecognized or marginalized lives? It would be more accurate to state the opposite. They and other oppositional intellectuals hold distinguished positions at major institutions, and they are regularly wined and dined as well as handsomely compensated. Many leading intellectuals, such as Cornell West or Camille Peglia, operate with agents who arrange fees and schedules for their many speaking engagements. What does this reveal about intellectual life today? A sign of the times is the exaltation of Stanley Fish that intellectual life increasingly mimics corporate practices in establishing conferences and travel as the coin of the realm. The flourishing of the conference circuit has brought with it new sources of extra income, increased opportunities for domestic and foreign travel, an ever-growing list of stages on which to showcase one's talents and geometric increase in the availability of the commodities for which academics yearn, attention, applause, fame. His only regret? The imitation of corporate largesse is only half-hearted, and the compensation for professor professors remain remains small. Yet it cannot be stated too forcefully. No link exists between institutional success and intellectual contribution. Good salaries, secure positions, and lucrative speaking engagements do not preclude original or subversive work, nor do paltry wages and insecure jobs guarantee revolutionary and critical thought. The notion that an empty larder engenders insight and a full table rationalizations reeks of a debased puritanism and crude materialism. If suffering gave rise to works of genius, the world would be awash in masterpieces. If misery caused social transformation, paradise would have arrived long ago. <coughs> For judging a single individual or one work of art, sociological observations may be a distraction. For surveying large intellectual patterns, however, a consideration of general economic and social trends may elude illuminate shifts and turns. Here it is relevant to ponder the impact of the institutionalization of intellectuals. How does it affect the way intellectuals think and approach the world? What does it mean, for instance, that many claim to be marginalized? Is it possible to be marginal and successful? Marginal in the mainstream? If marginalization includes holding unpopular or dissenting opinions, then the label is easy to apply but loses its meaning. Like alienation, a legal and philosophical concept, marginality succumbs to psychology. Alienation once referred to social relations and labor signifying an objective condition. Later it turned into an irritation or annoyance. I'm alienated, someone will announce, meaning I'm unhappy or uncomfortable. Marginal reflects the same psychologizing passing from a term designating an objective condition to one describing an individual's plight, it becomes a buzzword. Foucault and Derrida nudge the process along. Both of them un undermined the distinction between margin and center, laying the groundwork for purely subjective definitions. Foucault defined his project as trying to deploy a dispersion, a scattering, it is trying to operate a decentering that leaves no privilege to any center. One of Derrida's collections, titled Margins of Philosophy, seeks to blur the line which separates a text from its controlled margin. Derrida wants to compel. Uh, Derrida wants us uh, wants to compel us not only to reckon with the entire logic of the margin, but also to take an entirely other reckoning, which is doubtless to recall that beyond the philosophical text there is not a blank virgin empty margin, but another text, a weave of differences of forces, without any present center of reference. Everything, history, politics, economy, sexuality, etc., said not to be written in books. Though Derrida's thought res resists summarizing, the implications are obvious. The lines separating margins and center vanish. Can this text become the margin of a margin, he asks in his first essay, 
which is printed as a column parallel to another marginal text. Beyond the text, other texts of politics and the economy subsist. In a world composed of texts, no texts are central. Conversely, if there is no center, anything is marginal to something. This is music to the ears of many academics who, no matter how esteemed and established, often claim to be marginalized, victims lacking proper recognition and respect. They see themselves as outsiders, blasting the establishment, like uptown executives cruising around in pricey jeeps and corporate lawyers in luxurious utility trucks. They pose as rugged souls from the back country. They threaten the seats of power as they glide into their reserved parking spots. Derrida believes that he himself is an outsider. Many might view him as a consummately successful professor, an author who is endlessly cited, discussed, and celebrated. However, Derrida considers his own work as not at present well-received anywhere. It lacks a solid institutional or editorial home. He believes that he has been the object of a vast attack, which was in fact unleashed against me only in order to get get at my work and everything that can be associated with it. Gayatri Spivak, a chaired professor at Columbia University, a translator of Derrida and a much lionized speaker at academic conferences, also perceives herself as marginalized. With no, with no irony, she writes, on, she writes of the explosion of marginality studies in American universities and her role in it. Although integral to the marginality industry, she has been marginalized by the deconstructive establishment. On occasion, the, the irony, or at least the difficulty of successful marginality, strikes her. She quotes the description of a literary proposal that crossed her desk in which the author viewed American science fiction as the third world fiction of the industrialized nations. <coughs> she asks, how is the claim to marginality being negotiated here? The radicals of the industrialized nation want to be the third world. Yet she gets only half of it. Spivak is quoting from a grant proposal written by a brilliant young Marxist academic. That marginal intellectuals are filling out grants applications for American foundations elicits no comment. Intellectuals often trumpet their marginality, but their marginality is more and more marginal. Bell Hooks, the lowercase, bespeaks her nom de guerre. A professor at City College, New York, and a leading black feminist recounts grievous tales of marginality. On a plane journey, the good professor was outraged because a black friend with a coach ticket could not join her in first class, since the adjacent seat was already taken by a white passenger an incident of such proportions that it inspired her book, Killing Rage. Are these tales of marginality or privilege? She recounts other shocking stories. For instance, a report by a black Harvard graduate student about a seminar in which Professor Hooks's own work was read. Yet the day it was discussed in class, the white woman professor declared that no one was really moved by my work. This young black woman felt both silenced and victimized. Marginality gets refined to a comment about a comment about a book in a Harvard graduate seminar. The possibilities are endless. The point is, a sober appraisal of intellectuals in North America and Europe must not simply second or celebrate the classic picture of the vulnerable and independent critic but consider a newer and different reality. Any analysis must entertain the possibility that marginality is a pose and that the self-defined outsiders are and are glad to be consummate insiders. Indeed, Ajaz Ahmad, an Indian scholar, has suggested that the new discipline of post-colonial literature, which focuses exclusively on marginalized literature, is less a subversive field than a career move for largely upper-class Asian immigrants in American universities. Gerald Early, a professor of African American studies, has pondered whether multiculturalism as an academic field is a strategy for new intellectuals to obtain research money, publishing opportunities, and patronage. 
In the 1920s, Mannheim outlined the prospects for a scientific approach to, lo- to knowledge in politics, in which intellectuals advance from truth to skepticism. Though Mannheim hardly caused the transformation, he accurately anticipated its configurations. Yet one fiber in Mannheim protested against the developments he endorsed. Once he established that knowledge equaled ideology, and once he showed that all ideologies and all utopias deceive intellectuals, Mannheim drew back. How could humankind proceed without any vision of a future and better world? After debunking ideology and utopia for several hundred pages, Mannheim closed his book with a doubt. He feared his criticism of utopia would prove too damaging. The last sentences of ideology and utopia run. The disappearance of utopia brings about a static state of affairs in which man himself becomes no more than a thing. He would then be faced with the greatest paradox imaginable. After a long, tortuous, but heroic development, just at the highest stage of awareness, when history is ceasing to be blind fate and is becoming more and more man's own creation, with the relinquishment of utopia, man will lose his will to shape history and therewith his ability to understand it. If any readers made it to the book's conclusion, it hardly mattered. Mannheim's book expressed the zeitgeist. His concluding words were the, pain, were the vain protestations of the intellectual condemned by the author himself.